NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and the BBC. He's also a frequent guest on NPR and other syndicated radio programs. He's published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other leading national publications. Since 2012, he has served as, as professor at the South Texas College of Law, Houston. He's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He has, authored, he has authored three books. His latest, An Introduction to Constitutional Law, was a top five bestseller on Amazon. He has written more than five dozen law review articles that have been cited nearly a thousand times. And he was selected by Forbes Magazine for 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He's the president of the Harlan Institute, a nonprofit geared towards bringing a law school experience into high school classrooms. He blogs at the Volok Conspiracy and tweets at Josh M. Blackman. Please welcome Professor Josh Blackman. Thank you so much. It is, uh, it's so good to be with you. My last time in Galveston, I'm sad to say, was actually for this very event in 2015. Uh, that was on the 700th anniversary of Magna Carta. And I gave a speech about the role that Magna Carta has played in our constitutional discourse. Um, the theme this year was a bit different. It's, was it law in the time of change? Did I get that right? Constitution in the time of change. And I figured one way of telling how constitutional law has changed would be by reviewing Supreme Court cases. Specifically, 100 Supreme Court cases, which is the title of a book I wrote a couple years ago with Randy Barnett. An Introduction to Constitutional Law, 100 Supreme Court cases everyone should know. Um, buckle up. Uh, so the next 45 or 15 minutes or so until Kurt throws me out the window, um, I'm going to walk through 100 Supreme Court cases. This will be a crash course. Enjoy. Uh, the first batch of cases concern foundational cases on constitutional structure. The very first case is not Marbury. Marbury came much later. <clears throat> the very first constitutional decision from the Supreme Court was Chisholm against Georgia in 1793. This case established a principle that a citizen could sue a state. The Supreme Court rejected the notion of state sovereign immunity. Chisholm directly led to the enactment of the 11th Amendment, which, depending on how you read it, permits a citizen from suing another state. But left open the question of whether a citizen could sue his own state. Number two on the list is the one that everyone always knows, which is Marbury versus Madison. True, Marbury did not create the principle of judicial review. It existed long before. Indeed, John Marshall and Marbury basically copied Alexander Hamilton in Federal 78. But at least this was when the first time the Supreme Court declared an act of Congress unconstitutional. The third case is probably the most important decision in the history of the Supreme Court. It's not Marbury. We can live without Marbury. Uh, we cannot live without McCulloch. In McCulloch v. Maryland, we had the Bank of the United States, which was chartered by Congress. The state of Maryland tried imposing a tax on this federal bank. The Supreme Court held that, no, no, no. First off, Congress does have the enumerated power to create the bank. And second, the states cannot destroy this federal institution. This was the first case that discussed what's called the Necessary and Proper Clause, that Congress's powers go beyond those which are enumerated in Article 1, Section 8, what are called implied powers. With that, McCulloch, we don't have a republic. We'd be over real quick. Next case, Gibbons versus Ogden. New York granted a steamboat monopoly to a company. Another business in New Jersey said, oh, we're going to ignore that. The question was this, could Congress authorize boats moving from New Jersey to New York? If Congress could authorize that, then the states could not prohibit it. That is federal law supreme. So the Supreme Court held, again, for Chief Justice Marshall, that the states do, I'm sorry, Congress does have the power to regulate boats moving from one state to another. This was an example of commerce, literally commerce, intercourse between the states. The definition of commerce may seem to have expanded greatly, but not really. It hasn't gone far beyond what was in Gibbons v. Ogden. It was implied powers that made the biggest difference. 
Next case came in 1833, also by Chief Justice John Marshall. Barron against Baltimore. So poor, poor Barron. He owned a harbor in Baltimore Harbor. And then the city, due to construction, flooded his harbor so it was no longer usable, filled up with sand. He sued the city of Baltimore for a taking, a violation of Fifth Amendment rights. But no, the Supreme Court said, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution only limited federal power. The Fifth Amendment did not limit state power. That is, the Bill of Rights was not incorporated. Therefore, no damage could lie against the city of Baltimore for violating the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. All right. That's into part one. Part two is a long one. Enumerated powers. Okay? Enumerated powers. This is what are the powers that Congress has. The first decision we'll talk about was probably a very significant decision in the 1800s. Not talk about much today. Krieg versus Pennsylvania. Krieg concerned the Fugitive Slave Act. That is, could Congress create a law that allowed slave catchers to go from the southern state of Maryland into Pennsylvania and return a person back to Maryland? State of Pennsylvania said, no, 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 you can't do this, right? Congress does not have the power to enact the Fugitive Slave Act. The Supreme Court unanimously disagreed, and the court upheld the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, most people know Dred Scott, but this was actually a far more pernicious decision that enabled runaway slaves to be captured and returned back south. Um, and this was also a very broad reading of federal power, that the federal government had the power to even enact the slave law. Next case, far more boring, United States against DeWitt, 1869. Could Congress prohibit the sale of oil that was intrastate, right? We're not talking about shipping oil across state lines. Could they prohibit the sale of oil within a single state? Supreme Court said no, that the sale of oil was not commerce among the several states, and the implied powers did not reach that far. Fairly boring case. The next year, though, a far more consequential case. Hepburn against Griswold. Here the question presented, could Congress make paper money, gold greenbacks, could Congress make paper money legal tender? If you ever look at a dollar bill and say, this is legal tender, what does it actually mean? Under law, you're required to accept that as currency. Back then, people had the choice. They could reject paper money and say, we'll take gold only. In Hepburn versus Griswold, 1870, the court said no. Congress does not have the power to make paper money legal tender. Then, barely one year later, two new members came on to the Supreme Court, and they reversed Hepburn in Knox v. Lee. And in Knox v. Lee, the court said, yes, you can have legal tenders paper money. And the court adopted a very broad view of federal powers. We jump ahead two decades, United States versus E.C. Knight. This was an antitrust case. The federal government brought a prosecution against the ECNI company for building a sugar monopoly. They, they were consolidating all the very sugar refining companies into one. And the Supreme Court said that the manufacture of sugar itself is not interstate commerce. Therefore, the federal government cannot prohibit manufacturing sugar within one state. They can prohibit the shipment of the, of the sugar, but they can't prohibit the manufacture of the sugar. Now we go eight years ahead to Champion versus Ames. This case was a little bit different. In Champion, Congress passed a law prohibiting the interstate shipment of lottery tickets, right? Lottery tickets, which were considered sinful at the time. Here, the court upheld this power, saying that shipping lottery tickets was immoral and that the federal government had the power to clamp down on this immoral act. All right. So you had EC Knight kind of saying you can't prohibit local sugar manufacture, but Champion versus Ames said. You can prohibit shipping lottery tickets. We jump at 15 years to 1918, Hammer versus Dagenhart, also known as the child labor case. Here, Congress said that, that the, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court said that Congress cannot ban the local manufacture of goods with child labor, right? That, 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 that workplace conditions, how you're working in a, in, a, in a factory is for the states to decide and not for Congress. All right, so far the government's losing quite a bit. One more loss for the government. This was a big one, 9-0. 1935, 
Schechter Poultry versus United States, also called the Sick Chicken Case. Um, you might remember this one from law school. Here, uh, Congress enacts the National Industrial Recovery Act. It's not the National Rifle Association. It's a National Recovery Association, which created all these codes of fair labor and codes of conduct for every business. Um, in particular, they regulated the chicken industry in Brooklyn, New York. Go figure. And they said, if you want to buy a chicken in New York, you must take whatever chicken's there. You cannot pick and choose whatever chicken you want. Sort of an obscure rule. Uh, the Schechter brothers were kosher butchers in Brooklyn, and they objected to this rule on many grounds. They said that the Congress lacked the power to uh, regulate the local sale of chickens that were you know, within one state. And the Supreme Court agreed 9-0. This was a sort of high watermark for the court saying no to Congress. Because a couple of years later, things are going the other way. We get to 1937. This is a very important shift. NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steele. This case held that Congress, yes, could regulate locally manufactured goods like steel. And then we get to United States versus Darby, 1941, which held that, yes, Congress can regulate locally manufactured lumber. So the court's shifting the other direction that the manufacture, the creation of goods that were destined for interstate commerce could be regulated by the federal government. But then we get to number 16. This was perhaps one of the most significant cases in federal power of all time. 1942, Wickard versus Filburn. Farmer Roscoe Filburn was a farmer in Ohio. And according to the facts, he grew wheat for his animals and for consumption on his farm. He said, I never intend to ship this wheat on the market. It will never leave the state. It will never leave my farm. It's just my animals. Could Congress regulate locally, excuse me, locally grown wheat that was not destined for a market? In a very contentious decision that turned out to be 9-0, but it was very controversial at the time, the court said yes. Justice Jackson wrote the opinion. <laughs> excuse me. Justice Jackson wrote the opinion, and he said, it's true. This wheat is locally grown. It's not going to leave the state. But if we aggregate, that is, if we add together all the locally grown wheat throughout the country, in the aggregate, that locally grown wheat will have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. That if all these people are not buying market on the wheat because they grow it locally, that will affect prices. And Congress has a concern to keep prices stable. Therefore, you cannot grow locally sourced wheat if Congress says you cannot. This opinion more or less opened the door to an unlimited federal power. Because if you can regulate locally grown wheat, what can you not do? We'll get to some limits in a minute. Jump ahead to 1960s, 1964. In fact, there was an opinion from the Supreme Court this morning by Justice Stephen Breyer that cited this next case. Fun fact, Justice Breyer was clerking for the Supreme Court when this case was decided. He was with Justice Goldberg. So this morning, Justice Goldberg cited his old boss, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus United States, 1964. Here we have the Civil Rights Act of 64, which prohibits discrimination in public accommodations like hotels, uh, restaurants, and other, 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 other businesses. The Heart of Atlanta Motel said, wait a minute, we're a motel. We don't, we don't travel. Our hotel is in one place. How are we... How are we in interstate commerce, the Supreme Court said, well, hotel, you, you advertise to have, say, customers. People come to you from interstate, close enough to interstate commerce. Next case was tougher. Katzenbach versus McClung, 1964. Ollie's Barbecue in Birmingham was a restaurant. They did not cater to have, say, customers. They did not advertise out of state. It was entirely locally sourced business. So they said, wait a minute. You use food from out of state. You use products in the kitchen from out of state. That's good enough. You have what's called a jurisdictional hook. As long as Congress can put some hook into interstate commerce from your presentation, from your business, that is sufficient. So again, Wickard, Heart of Atlanta, Katzenbach, more or less flung open the doors of federal power. Then we get way ahead. We go from 1964 to 1987. Not much change in that interim. The Supreme Court more or less said, okay, federal powers, Congress, do whatever you want. Then we get to 1987. And the courts aren't a little bit more conservative. And we have South Dakota versus Dole. 
Um, here, Congress passed a law saying, hey, hey, states, you want some highway money? Go raise your drinking age to 21. It's a, be a shame if you lose that highway money, right? And the Supreme Court said, that's okay because the amount of money was very little. It wasn't a lot of money. And states had a choice whether to say yes or no to that. But the court suggested if it becomes coercive, if too much money is being withheld, then Congress cannot put that limitation on the spending power. This is an early preview of what we call the spending power jurisprudence. Then we get to the earth shattering kaboom. Out of San Antonio, Texas, 1995, United States against Lopez. A student brought a gun to a school. Now that violated state law. You can't bring a gun to a school. They also violated federal law, the federal uh, gun free, uh, the gun free school zone act. He was charged in federal court. And the Fifth Circuit said, no, 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 you can't do this. That the possession of a gun in a school zone is not commerce among the several states. Therefore, the statute was unconstitutional. 5-4 vote, Supreme Court agreed and held that Congress could not enact this law. Now, what's not well known is that Congress reenacted the exact same law with like three extra sentences saying, well, if the gun traveled in interstate commerce, it's fine. So this entire case was just earth shattering kaboom that Congress fixed very quickly. Then we get to 2000, the United States against Morrison. This is Chrissy Brazoncala. She was a student at Virginia Tech. She says she was sexually assaulted by football players at her college. And she brought suit against the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, she brought suit against her university and the football players. But then the argument was, can Congress regulate domestic violence? This was actually was Joe Biden's baby. He was very proud of it. And the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot. That, that the, a domestic violence is not an economic act. Therefore, Congress cannot regulate it. Five years further, Gonzalez versus Raich, 2005. This case involves marijuana. At the time, it was still illegal. I think it's still illegal today, last time I checked. Um, Angel Raich used locally grown marijuana. It was not sold. It was not on a market. It was grown in a garden somewhere in California. Never going to be sold. Congress still asserted power to prohibit locally grown marijuana. Uh, now, my colleague, Randy Burnett, argued this case. He lost. Uh, but the upshot of this case was, even if you have some local activity, it can be prohibited if it's part of some broader regulatory scheme. That was a holding under Gonzalez versus Rage. Jump ahead seven years to 2012, the year I started teaching, and the subject of my first book, NFIB versus Sibelius, the Obamacare decision. This case, oh, wait, this case. Well, let's start this way. Number one, Congress cannot make you buy insurance. No, 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 like Bruno, no, no, no. But Congress can tax you for going uninsured. Huh? Ask John Roberts. The second part of the opinion is involving the Medicaid expansion. Congress cannot condition participation in Medicaid on the threat of losing all funds. They said, well, if you want your Medicaid money, you have to join this new program for Obamacare. Uh, you can't do that. So it was this weird opinion that left the ACA largely intact, and it's in fact still largely intact today. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. All right, part three, federalism limits on congressional power. This is how federalism limits Congress's power. The first case is New York versus United States, 1992. We had a problem. There was a lot of radioactive waste in the United States. And Congress said, okay, we have an idea. States, you will take ownership of this waste and it'll be your responsibility. Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't do that. You cannot force or commandeer the states to take action. And that's what this law was. A couple years later, we get to Prince against United States. Here, Congress tried telling sheriffs that to perform background checks or gun purchases. No, 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 the Supreme Court says that is commandeering of state executive branch officials. You cannot do that. Now we go back in time a bit, talk about sovereign immunity. In Hans versus Louisiana, a citizen of Louisiana sued his own state. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. Now, the 11th Amendment doesn't expressly bar a citizen from suing his own state, but the Supreme Court said, we don't really focus on the text of the 11th Amendment. We focus on what it stands for. Then we get to Seminole Tribe versus Florida. Uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida versus Florida, 1996. Here, what happens? The Supreme Court says, well, 
Congress, you cannot waive a state's sovereign immunity, right? Congress cannot waive a state's sovereign immunity. Here, the Seminole Tribe of Florida tried to sue the state of Florida. Congress lacks the power to enable that lawsuit. Number 28, City of Bernie versus Flores from right here in Texas. What happened? Congress enacts RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is a federal law that allows suits for violating religious freedom. So Archbishop Flores sues the city of Bernie. Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can't do that. Congress does not have the power to waive Texas sovereign immunity, even for violation of religious freedom. But then we get to this last case, Nevada Department of Human Resources versus Hibbs. And here the court allowed the waiver of sovereign immunity for the Family Medical Leave Act, kind of this weird anomalous case, but there are limits on the sovereign immunity power. Okay, keep moving. We're actually on a perfect schedule, 20 minutes in. Um, part four, executive power. This is the powers of the presidency. The first decision, ex parte, Merriman. Um, during the Civil War, President Lincoln, and can I get one of those plates too? later? Thank you. And during the Civil War, President, I always have to ask, they don't always, they don't always serve the speaker. It's actually, it's, it's <laughs> the, welcome, Galveston. Thank you. Uh, ex parte Merriman, 1861. During the Civil War, President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. What does that mean? The military could detain someone without giving them any judicial process. Now, this case was never decided by the Supreme Court, right? It was never decided by the Supreme Court, but there was a decision by Chief Justice Roger Taney. And Roger Taney wrote that only Congress can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, not the president. Um, Merriman was never freed. Uh, it was a very strange decision, which I'd love to talk more about. But this decision is probably correct, but didn't help Merriman very much right away, at least. The next executive power decision is very well known. It's called Korematsu versus United States, of course, from 1944. This case upheld Congress's and the president's detention of Japanese Americans during the war. Now, mind you, some of these uh, uh, Japanese people were American citizens. So even U.S. citizens were detained without any due process of law. This case is, one of the, is known as one of the anti-canon cases, a case we do not like. Uh, the, chief, the Supreme Court pretended to have ruled this case a few years ago, but you don't really have a rule case. That's not how it works. Uh, the other case is a classic, one of my favorites. Um, 1952, Youngstown Chief, Two Company versus Sawyer. This is the so-called Steele's, <clears throat> Steel's Teacher case. During the middle of the Korean War, President Truman ordered the seizure of steel mills to keep the supply lines running because they were about to go on strike. Okay, what happens? Supreme Court says, no, 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 you can't do this. It's up to Congress and not the executive to seize private property. All right. Part five, separation of powers. The first case, Morrison against Olson. This case concerns the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute, right? Could Congress create this sort of this separate independent prosecutor in the executive branch? Supreme Court says yes. Uh, famously, Justice Scalia had a dissent, which I think was correct, saying this wolf comes as a wolf. <coughs> 2014, NLRB versus Noel Canning. This decision, this decision concerns the recess appointments power. Can the president make a recess appointment when the Senate breaks for three days? Supreme Court says, no, you cannot. It's got to be a longer period, maybe 10 days. We're not really sure. Justice Breyer wrote the majority opinion. He's not very good on specifics. All right, now we go back in time. Part six, slavery and the Reconstruction Amendment. Our discussion begins 19, I'm sorry, 1857 with Dred Scott versus Sanford, a case most people are familiar with. Uh, most people don't know what the case actually stood for, though. Um, the basis of this decision was actually jurisdiction. I'm sure you know that diversity jurisdiction. If a person in one state sues a person in another state, the federal courts have diversity jurisdiction, right? That is, a citizen of one state sues a citizen of another state. But was 
Dred Scott a citizen? That was the question presented. Uh, the court split seven to two, saying that no, Scott was not a citizen, and people of African descent could never be citizens. So indirectly, the court ruled on this very foundational question of citizenship in what's otherwise a mundane dispute about diversity jurisdiction. You learn that in Civ Pro. Next up, 1873, the slaughterhouse cases. This was one of the first cases at the Supreme Court involving the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, New Orleans enacts a monopoly. They give a monopoly on butchers that if you want to run a, a, a butcher shop in New Orleans, you must use this facility. Okay, that's nice. The butchers argued it violates the privileges or immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. It violates the right to earn a living. The Supreme Court says, no, that does not work. That the 14th Amendment does not protect the right to earn a living. Next up, Brattle v. Illinois. She was a woman. She wanted to be a lawyer. State of Illinois said, no, you cannot be a lawyer. Doesn't allow it. She went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed. There is no constitutional right to become an attorney, especially if you're a female. Not a very popular decision with my students today. At least half, at least half the class. Uh, 1875, U.S. versus Crookshank. This was in the first case involving incorporation. That is, does the 14th Amendment incorporate the First and Second Amendment? The Supreme Court says no, that even though a lynch mob deprived the right of people to bear arms and, fr and freely assemble, there was no violation of civil rights. 39, Strader versus West Virginia. This case held that a law requiring um, only white people to serve in a jury was unconstitutional. It was one of the rare cases in this era where we actually had a victory that was somewhat pro-civil rights. Next case went the other way. Nine, I'm sorry, 1883, these civil rights cases. Here, Congress enacts a federal law that bars discrimination in places of public accommodation. The Supreme Court said that law is unconstitutional, that Congress cannot regulate local workplace conditions, they cannot permit discrimination in the states, that goes beyond their powers under the 14th Amendment. Fast forward to 1886, Yikwo versus Hopkins. This was a, another famous case. Uh, San Francisco barred, I'm sorry, San Francisco put limits on who could run a, a laundromat in the city. At the time, virtually all the laundromats were run by Chinese people. And the Supreme Court held for actually complex reasons that the law was uh, unconstitutional, but in part that a state could not enact a neutral law that had this sort of effect on racial minorities. The, the re reasoning is actually opaque, but we'll leave it there. Next case, most people know, 1896, Plessy against Ferguson. This is the famous railroad case. Uh, New Orleans segregated the railroads in Louisiana. Uh, Homer Plessy got on board the train. He said, uh, I want to get into the white person's car. He was not allowed. The Supreme Court upheld an 8 to 1 vote this regime, uh, saying, basically saying that separate could be equal under the 14th Amendment. And this ruling basically paved the way for Jim Crow. All right, moving on. We're about halfway done, guys. Part 7, expanding the scope of the Due Process Clause. 43, ooh, Lochner, the scary case. Well, you know, I don't think it's that bad. Um, Lochner was a case that upheld, I'm sorry, that declared unconstitutional the Bake Shop Act. New York limited how many hours bakers could work, and the Supreme Court said it violates the Due Process Clause. Um, people think it was the worst case ever. It wasn't that bad. Uh, Number 44, Mueller against Oregon. This law is a little bit different. Instead of limiting the hours of bakers, it created a maximum hour law for women. This law survived on the theory that women were inferior and they needed the state's protection. So go figure. Number 45, Buchanan versus Warley. This was an important case where the city of Louisville enacted a, a discriminatory ordinance that people of the same race could not buy houses on the same block, basically forced racial segregation in residential housing. Unanimously, the court said 9-0, unconstitutional. 1923, Atkins versus Children's Hospital. Here, the District of Columbia, through Congress, imposed a minimum wage, not for everyone, but just for women and children. And the Supreme Court said that, no, you can't do that. You cannot force the minimum wage upon women only. They have the same rights of contract as everyone else does. Number 47, Meyer against Nebraska. This was a law that barred the teaching of foreign languages in schools, but not just any foreign languages, <laughs> non-classical languages. You could, you could teach Latin and Greek, but you could not teach German, for example. Supreme Court said, 
unconstitutional. Parents have the right to direct the upbringing of their children, including what languages they learn in school. 48, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, 1925. Here the court said, well, I'm sorry, here the state of Oregon basically said we're going to shut down private schools, religious schools and non-religious schools. Uh, Supreme Court said, no, you cannot do that. Parents, again, have the right to direct the upbringing of their children. You cannot criminalize private schools. 1927, another anti-canon case, Buck versus Bell. Virginia had a law that imposed forcible sterilization on so-called imbeciles. Yes, if you were deemed an imbecile, you would be sterilized. Supreme Court upheld this by an 8-to-1 vote. Justice Holmes wrote the opinion, and he wrote most famously, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Stop reproducing to the Buck family. Number 50, case probably no one's ever heard of, but it's important. O'Gorman and Young versus Hartford Fire Insurance Company. This court upheld a law restricting commissions on contracts, even though the other side said, we have a right to charge whatever commissions we want. Supreme Court said, no, that's not right. 51, okay, we're halfway done, guys. Uh, Nebbia versus New York, 1934. New York put a max, I'm sorry, a minimum price on bread, right? You couldn't, or sorry, on milk. You couldn't charge less than a certain amount of money for milk. Okay. So this guy, Leo Nebbia, is an idea. Okay, fine. We'll keep milk at the minimum price, but I'll throw a free loaf of bread. Basically, get around the price control. Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't do that. New York can control the price of milk. 1950, I'm sorry, 1937, West Coast Hotel v. Parish. This was the famous case, which is called the switch in time that saved nine. That's not even accurate. But in West Coast Hotel v. Parish, the Supreme Court upheld a minimum wage law. They said, yes, Washington, you can uphold a minimum wage. This more or less reverses Atkins versus Children's Hospital. 53, United States versus Caroline Products. This decision is most famous for the footnote four, uh, which said there are certain types of rights which the court will review diligently, fundamental rights. But so-called non-fundamental rights are viewed with a rational basis standard. 54, William Simply Optical pushed it even further. Here the court said, if Congress can have any basis on which to uphold the law, we'll uphold it. This was sort of the high watermark of the post-New Deal judge. We'll say, look, we're not going to get involved with all these striking out laws anymore. That would last like three or four years <laughs> until the Warren Court got going. Okay, now we get to race. Equal protection clause. First case, everybody knows. Uh, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. This court held that separate but equal has no place in public education. Did not overrule Plessy, common myth, but it said you cannot have separate uh, segregated schools in public education. All right. 1956, Bowling versus Sharp. This was a case people forgot about, but the Equal Protection Clause exists in the 14th Amendment. That controls states. The Fifth Amendment, which controls Congress, lacks an Equal Protection Clause. So why are federal schools in the District of Columbia unconstitutional if they're segregated? No good answer. Supreme Court said, well, we'll just make something up. We'll say due process, something else. But as it stands today, both the state governments and the federal governments are bound by the same protection clause. We don't look at the text, right? 1958, Cooper against Aaron. This was a very significant decision. Little Rock maintained their schools as segregated. President Eisenhower sent in 101st Airborne to desegregate the schools. And a couple years later, the Supreme Court said, we mean it, right? We mean it. You guys have to desegregate. Okay. What did Little Rock do in response? They just shut down their schools for a couple of years, which shows the limits of powers of judges. Right, Judge Brown? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> right? Uh, judges can only say what to do. They can't tell people what to do. Unless you got men with guns and helmets, judges can't get very far. Number 58, Loving Against Virginia, 1967. This case held that the ban on interracial marriage was unconstitutional. It violated both equal protection and due process. 59, Regions of California versus Bakke. This case considered uh, the University of California Davis's affirmative action policy. The court held that UC's policy was unconstitutional because it imposed a quota, but perhaps some other policy might be valid. What would that other policy be? In Gratcher's Bollinger 2003, the court said, well, Michigan Law School, I'm sorry, Michigan undergrad, quota, right? They gave a specific number of points for affirmative action, right? If you, had, if you were a certain race, you just get blank points on your resume. But the law school, the Michigan Law School, 
You use race as one of many factors, and therefore it was valid. Uh, this case we overruled about a year, so probably the last time I'll have the slide open, uh, but I think we'll rule this case in Harvard and UNC cases, so enjoy the slide while you can. It'll be gone soon. Um, oh, this case is definitely going to overruled as well. Uh, Fisher 1 and Fisher 2, the Supreme Court came back to affirmative action in 2013 uh, with Abigail Fisher. The UT uh, policy said, well, it's probably unconstitutional. Go take another look at it at district court. Uh, the Fifth Circuit ignored it, went back to the Supreme Court. And again, the Supreme Court upheld the UT policy. At the time, Justice Scalia died, and then Justice Kennedy changed his mind, and that was it. But yeah, this case we've ruled very quickly, so don't, don't, don't get too used to it. All right, part nine, equal protection of the laws, sex discrimination, and others. 1973, Frontiero versus Richardson. This was actually a case in which Justice Ginsburg argued. Um, Sharon Frontiero was a member of the Air Force. She was married. Her husband was working as well. And the government did not want to give benefits to Sharon's husband. He said, well, you know, if we just presume that, you know, husband's working, right? We don't, we don't want to give the husband money as well. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't do this. And they started to say that equal protection also protects gender discrimination. Okay. 1976, Craig against Boren, another famous uh, sort of Ginsburg case. Uh, here, the state of Oklahoma sell beer to girls at the age of 18, but to boys at 21. Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't do that. And unfortunately, they leveled up. Now girls had to buy it at 21 as well. So that was an important case. 1996, I think most of you were born at this point, uh, U.S. versus Virginia. The Virginia Military Institute did not permit women's cadets. Supreme Court said, per Justice Ginsburg, no, that's unconstitutional. 1985, Cleburne versus Cleburne Living Center. Here, the, uh, uh, the city of Cleburne denied a permit to build a home for the uh, mentally handicapped people. Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. It violates equal protection. Rumor against Evans, 1996. Here, the state tried to make it harder to get certain protections to gays and lesbians. Again, the court said, no, you cannot do this. Sensing a pattern. These are all the Kennedy cases, which are, again, are mostly in the chopping block now. All right, now we get to part 10, substantive due process. Uh, the beginning is, of course, 1965, Griswold v. Connecticut. The Supreme Court held that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment protects certain liberties, including the right of contraception. And there was this zany opinion how there are the penumbras, the emanations, other nonsense. Uh, it was not a well-thought-out decision, but it's a basis of modern law. Oh, good one today. Right, so number 70, Roe v. Wade, 1973. This one may not make it two months. I'm not sure. Um, but this case held that the uh, 14th Amendment protects a right of abortion. Um, again, I don't think this decision makes it to July. 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, number 71. This case declined to overrule Roe, but instead expanded on the decision in a way and also contracted and says that uh, uh, the courts will still uh, check abortion legislation, but it won't be quite as permissive as Roe. This case is gone by the end of June. This one's for sure. Number 72, Holman's Health versus Hellerstead. Uh, this was a case where they more or less reaffirmed Casey, and they said that Texas's abortion laws were unconstitutional. Uh, 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 again, I think this one just is not long for this world. Uh, 2003, Lawrence v. Texas. Here, a lot of Texas cases, if you noticed. Uh, 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 the Supreme Court said that, tex that, that Texas's ban on uh, uh, sodomy was unconstitutional. Con unconstitutional. This case actually arose in Houston, of all places, right? Our Harris County DA decided to go after John Lawrence, and it was a terrible decision. It led to this, this case. So uh, he, he is long out of office. All right, 74, uh, U.S. versus Windsor. Uh, that's E.D. Windsor. Uh, this case declared unconstitutional the Defense of Marriage Act as a violation of the Fifth Amendment's due process clause that Congress cannot deny benefits to gay couples under the Constitution. Then the big one, number 75, right on schedule. A Burger v. Hodges. This case declared marriage law unconstitutional because dignity, because the 14th Amendment protects a right of dignity that this law deprives gay couples of, something like that. Okay, part 11, freedom of speech. Now moving on to the Bill of Rights. Okay, so now we have a, a series of cases decided in, during World War I. Congress had a law called the Sedition Act, which let the government punish people who engage in speech that was critical to the war effort. So in Schenck versus United States, a person opposed army recruiting. He was prosecuted for a speech, upheld. Debs versus United States, 
They went after poor Eugene Debs, who was a socialist who opposed the war. His conviction was upheld. He was later pardoned. But then the big case was Abrams versus the United States, where just Holmes flipped sides. Now Holmes said that prosecutions for speech are unconstitutional. This is a very significant case. Then we get to Gitlow versus New York. And this case was the first decision that hinted that the 14th Amendment incorporates the uh, free speech clause. That is now the, the states are barred from violating the freedom of speech. Number 80, Stromberg versus California. The court said that a ban on waving red flags is unconstitutional. 81, United States versus O'Brien. This case, uh, sorry, this case upheld Congress's power to ban draft card burning. Right? They said, "Well, we're we're not banning the draft card burning to to disciple speech. It's for keeping records, right? If you're burning your card, you don't have a record." The court rejected this argument. Oops, sorry, went too far. Texas versus Johnson, another Texas case, right? This case upheld. I'm sorry, this case said that the state cannot ban flag burning. So you 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 can't ban your draft. Uh, sorry, you can't burn your draft card. But you can't burn the American flag. Keep that in mind for your kids, right? You have to know what we can and can't burn. RV versus City of St. Paul involved cross burning. So you can burn a cross, you can burn a flag, but you can't burn a draft card. Everyone got that? Okay, Nate, you earned your CLE today. Um, maybe, right? Do I get CLE? I think I get CLE, right? I'm, I'm, I'm educating myself, I suppose, right? Uh, number 84, Buckley versus Vallejo. This was a decision that upheld a campaign finance law. They created this weird distinction between independent expenditures and contributions. Contributions, bad. Expenditures, good. Right? Whatever. That, those are the ruling. Uh, in 85, uh, 2003, McConnell versus FEC, the court largely upheld the McCain-Feingold Campaign Finance Act. But about seven years later, in a case called Citizens United versus FEC, the court scaled it back. And it seems to suggest that Congress does not have this interest in regulating free speech. 87, next case, New York Times against Sullivan. New York Times against Sullivan. This case made it harder to sue public officials for defamation. I'm sorry, it made it harder for public officials to sue for defamation. Uh, public officials who are slandered must show what's called actual malice to bring the suit forward. Snyder versus Phelps is one of the few signs that could actually show in, in good company. Uh, 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 protected the right of the Westboro Baptist to protest at military funerals. These are awful human beings. But even they have free speech rights. 89, U.S. versus Stevens. This one's kind of gross. Uh, Congress tried to ban films about. Uh, uh, sorry. Congress tried to ban crush films. You know what a crush film is? You go to human beings. This is where women torture small animals for sexual gratification. You're welcome. Now you've earned your appetite. Um, he filmed, he, or at least he distributed videos of this stuff, and they tried to prosecute him and said, no, you can't do this, that the statute was constitutional. Because it was restricting speech based on its content. Brown versus EMA. California tried to ban the sale of violent video games to minors. SCOTA said no go. Even kids have free speech rights. Uh, Justice Thomas said the view that they do not, that, 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 that the parents have all the rights. Okay, part 12, right on cue. Free exercise of religion. Sherbert versus Werner. Uh, Adele Sherbert was a. Um, uh, uh, a Seventh day Adventist. She did not want to work on Saturday. The state said, no, if you don't want to work on Saturday, you don't get your benefits for unemployment. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Sherbert, which basically said violations of free exercise are reviewed with strict scrutiny. Not so much. Next case, 1990, Employment Division versus Smith. Al Smith was a Native American. He used peyote, was fired from his job. He was a drug counselor, after all. Um, and then he sued for unemployment benefits. And he said, wait a minute, I, you know, they're, they're targeting him for my religion. Supreme Court said, nope, it's neutral, neutral law, reviewed with rational basis review, even if birds are for exercise. Next up, city of uh, Lukumi, I'm sorry, Church of Lukumi Babalu IA versus city of Hialeah. Here, a city in Florida banned the Santeria practice of animal sacrifice, of sacrificing chickens. It's very obvious why they enacted this law. It was out of uh, animus towards the, high, the, 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 the Lukumi faith. Supreme Court said you cannot do that. This was targeting a faith. Next case, Burrell versus Hobby Lobby Stores involves the ACA. Uh, uh, this company did not want to provide certain forms of emergency birth control on their insurance policy. Supreme Court agreed it was a violation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. All right, almost done. Part 13, Establishment Clause. McCreary County of AC, I'm sorry, McCreary County of Kentucky versus ACLU. 
Here, the court said a paper display of a Ten Commandments on a courthouse wall was unconstitutional. But number 96, Van Orden versus Perry, a seven foot tall granite statue of the Ten Commandments is valid. So, why was the one in Texas allowed to stay up? The one in Kentucky comes down? Ask Justice Breyer, because he was a swing vote. He voted <laughs> for the ACLU in this case, he voted for Texas in this case. I say farewell, Justice Breyer. We don't really. Well, anyway, it was a thing of the past, but he thought. Now, now I'm not so concerned. We're actually, funny, I removed these two cases from the casebook now because we just, we don't really, it's not important anymore. Okay. Almost done. Part 14, right to bear arms. D.C. v. Heller 2008 held that the Second Amendment protects a right to bear arms. It's an individual right, not tied to malicious service. Number 98, McDonald v. Chicago held that the Second Amendment is incorporated as against the states by virtue of the 14th Amendment. We got two more guys. We're almost done. Part 15, taking private property. Number 99, Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahon. This court held that when the government reduces the value of your property, it may actually be a taking of private property. And drum roll, please. Did it on time. Look at that. 1250. Kilo versus City of New London. The Supreme Court held that taking property for, for economic development was a public use under the Fifth Amendment. That's permissible. I am done. Thank you all for your attention. Do I sit down now? Hit my lunch? All right. Thanks so much.